to Preterist Apologetics. This is Mike Sullivan over here to my left, right, something like that. Anyway, uh, and my name is Don K. Preston. It's good to be back with you. Always have a good time here. And we try to bring you some really substantive material, a lot of stuff to chew on. And Mike, I'm pretty sure, you know, people said at the uh, Jonesboro Conference, they were people were talking to me about the number of your charts, the number of my charts and all the material we pack in there. And I told uh, I told I told several people, actually, I said, well, my approach is that way on purpose. I know very good and well that nobody is going to absorb everything I have to say, everything that's going to be on the charts. But hopefully they'll get the PowerPoints, they'll get the lessons, they'll go back in the privacy of their own home. They'll slow the speed down just a little bit and take notes, do their comparison. And over a period of time, they'll be able to absorb the whole thing. And that's a little bit what we what we do on this program, folks. We we understand that you're probably not going to catch every point that we make at the time we make it. But the great thing about it is it's right here on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook. You can go back at, at your own leisure and study it. And we hope we hope that you don't just take our word for it, that you have your Bible, you have your pen, your paper. And if you got lexicons, when we refer to the Greek or even the Hebrew, that you will check this stuff out for yourself. Um, you know, we're not like an awful lot of people that get offended if you want to take issue with something that we say. Now, we don't say things lightly, frivolously, or without thinking that we've done a lot of research. But you know what? That doesn't guarantee that we're right. And so if you think you catch us in inadvertent mistakes, error, whatever you'd like to call it, then feel free to feel free to contact us and say, well, I think you made a think you made a mistake on the following. I, I, I think you're in error on this. OK, that's fine. We can discuss it and, and we might even discuss it here on this program and saying, hey, somebody, Mike, somebody said this or that about something you and Don said. I don't think you're right. So what do you think about this? So. Yeah. That, that's that's certainly my position. I know it's Mike's and we just we just want you to know that we're nothing but Bible students. That's all the world we claim to be. We, we work and we research diligently, long hours and what have you. And we're, we're simply doing the best that we can to share our understanding with you. Mike, you want to pitch in here and add any comments? Yeah, um, Don and I know our audience very, very well over the years of 30 plus years for me and probably 40 plus years for Don and that the full predators community are studiers. They're, they're not your average church goer. That's why we pack so much in some of yeah. our lectures. And even when we do this show, sometimes I try and translate some of my charts on different topics and put them in the PowerPoint slides. Or if Don has a, a chart that he wants to put up, we, we try and do that um, because we know that that's a useful tool for you. Um, I'm a visual learner. I love Absolutely. the analogy of faith and I love to put it, I love to put my charts together as a visual confirmation of what I'm seeing and what I'm writing kind of as a summary. And it just, it just reinforces everything. So that's why we do what we do. Yep. Amen. Amen. So last week we talked about Jesus and the song of Moses. And I, I believe we finished that up. Now we're getting into Paul and the song of Moses. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Right. Even though we've covered it some, I mean, this is good stuff. Right. Right. And I think you were even touching on this for, I, I've got these numbered if you want to just go through them or if there's a particular. No, that's thing. fine. I, yeah, okay. Let's just follow your numbering. It's fine. All right. Um, so Paul's eschatology, number one. So we're talking about in Israel's last days, a terminal, perverse and faithless generation would arrive and some would not believe and thus not be his people. They would have a blemish, a stain, 
course, when we get into Peter in the Song of Moses, Peter yeah. really quotes that <laughs> and gets into that. But Paul, he does talk about his audience being in the last days. Um, and he informs us that they were the terminal perverse and crooked generation. And again, Don, I'm just, I, I am shocked. Once I've learned this, <clears throat> I mean, I've been a, a full predator for many years, but once I started studying the Song of Moses, and really just catching that he's dealing with a, 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 ter a very specific terminal last day's generation that will come in the appointed time. And then I see these prophecy experts constantly telling me that I'm the terminal generation when yeah. Jesus and Paul and Peter tell us they were the terminal generation going back to, to the song of Moses. It's just... I, it's just so unfortunate to see such error, but that's what well, we... I, I agree 100 percent. It, it's stunning. But let, let's face it, Mike, so many people are, to use the term, egocentric. Mm. That is to say, narcissistic. They, I'll, I'll use that. <laughs> I didn't use it. <laughs> I, I, I was being nice. <laughs> it's, our, it's our sinful nature. We're, we're all prone to be that way. We are prone to be that way. You're exactly right. Uh, we think we think everything about everything is all about us. Yeah. And and so when we read about the last days and, of course, uh, the, the modern way of looking at things is, oh, well, look, Jesus said there'd be wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, uh, pestilence, peril, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look around and we've never, ever, ever seen such a time like we are seeing now, which, of course, betrays an ignorance of history. You know, Gary DeMar in his last day's madness does a great job, for instance, on earthquakes uh, of, of quoting <laughs> the geographic, uh, uh, geological, excuse me, authorities who point out, no, we're not seeing more earthquakes in our generation than have ever occurred. That's just simply not historically accurate. What we do have today is better methodology of reporting. I mean, they, you know, they've got these seismometers set up all around the world now. And if a little bitty tremor happens in Spain, oh, we got an earthquake. Well, it might have been a point, point oh five, you know, quake, uh, kind of like we experienced right here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, every once in a while. I mean, every once, every once in a blue moon, this happened two years ago. My wife and I were, and I were getting ready to go to bed. I was already in bed and she was just walking out of the bathroom and all of a sudden you, you hear this ultra low frequency and our, our house goes Whoop, just like that. <laughs> and she stops and I look at her and she looks at me like, whoa, was that an earthquake? Yeah, that's what that was. But anyway, people are not aware of what was happening in the first century. Really, honestly, they, they are not. And that's not because they're evil or wicked. It's because they're ill-informed because they've never done the research. But there's enough material out there, historical data available out there. Uh, for instance, there shall be wars and rumors of wars. Now, years and years and years ago, I set out to write a book on the Olivet Discourse. I wanted to chronicle each one of these things that Jesus said would come. When I got to wars and rumors of wars, I, I dug deeply into Josephus, into Tacitus, Suetonius, all of the, well, not all, but many, of, most of the prominent ancient historians of the day. And wow, I, I was absolutely blown away that in that singular generation, when Jesus said <clears throat> there should be wars and rumors of wars, until 70 AD, there, there was an absolute minimum of 45 major conflicts in the Roman Empire. Wasn't there an earthquake so big that that's, oh. what, that's what let the Idumeans in, the Zealots? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Josephus records that, that. As a matter of fact, he uh, in describing the events of that, he says there was a storm and an earthquake that was so dramatic, it seemed that, that, that quote, the very fabric of creation, unquote, mm. was coming apart. Mm. Now, I mean, how do we ignore this kind of stuff? Right. And so when you go down the list of everything that Jesus said, well, here's what's going to happen. There, there were several earthquakes that shook Rome, for instance. There was one, one earthquake that was so severe, it interrupted the flow of grain 
into the city and over 30,000 people died from famine inside the city as a result of an earthquake. Mm. And this is just, I mean, these are just things that took place. And again, people are not aware of it. So when they hear about an earthquake taking place in Brisbane or wherever, India, they, they read about floods and pestilence and things like that. Well, they'd never heard anything like this before. They've, they've never seen anything like this before. And once again, it's because they're not informed. They're not, they're not well read on history to know what took place in the first century. Yeah. And that's really lamentable. <clears throat> exactly. And on this, uh, this terminal generation, I think we've got a couple of different things here in uh, Philippians 2.15. Oh, yeah. And you may be blameless. Yeah, that's, that's a wedding motif. Blameless. Yeah. And, and it's a judicial statement as well. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. Okay, there's Deuteronomy 32 as well. Um, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, that's Deuteronomy 32, 5 and 20, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And then we go into chapter three and we have that already and not yet um, resurrection. Deuteronomy 32 talks about, I kill and I make alive. alive. And everywhere I've looked in the old Testament, at least it's a corporate bodily yeah. killing. When, when Israel would break covenant, God would strike her. He would kill her corporately spiritually covenantally then when they come back into the land he raises her um so here in philippians and we also have apic mm-hmm, Yep. and this resurrection passage and you know peter lightheart says apic decamai in first corinthians one um with the gifts and that anticipating being on tiptoes of expectation of the day of the lord and the end there of the old covenant age and the the gifts confirming them until that end. He says, oh, that's referring to AD 70. Well, <laughs> if Apoch Dekemai there is referring to AD 70, Apoch Dekemai is in Romans 8, and it's it's here in the next chapter. So again, folks, when Paul is saying he's the term, they are the terminal generation, that's the, that's the foundation upon which Paul builds all of his eminence, whether it's the resurrection or the second coming. That's the framework. You know, when you put together a puzzle, you always start at all the corners yep. to get your framework right, right? So Paul is a full preterist. He has <laughs> his framework built upon the eschatology of Moses, and he's very confident. He's not mistaken, like Tucker Carlson and Glenn Beck say, uh, <laughs> Jesus and, and the <laughs> apostles were mistaken. Um, or Steve no. Greg, for that matter. Yeah, they're appealing to Moses, and they've got it right. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth concerning things to come, specifically eschatology, folks. They couldn't get it wrong. Look, if they got it wrong, we're in the wrong business. We're do- I'm wasting a lot of time here. <laughs> if, if, I, if I can't trust what Jesus and the New Testament apostles said about eschatology, they can't, they may not be right about anything else. I, I was, I was literally stunned when I got Steve Gregg's book. He sent me a copy of it. Yeah. He's very gracious and sent me a copy of his book and I'm reading it. And as you well know, I, I did a review. I think I did a total of 50 programs reviewing and responding to his book. Of, uh, Why not full preterism? But I read in his book, it should not disturb us if the apostles were wrong about what they taught about the second coming of Christ. I just about fell over in my chair. We shouldn't be disturbed by that. Wow. I I just, you know, and, and he's a good guy. He's a very, very friendly, very gregarious guy, a, commu- a good communicator. But when you, when you base your eschatology on a possibly confused set of biblical writers, then how do I know that anything you're saying about what they taught could possibly be true? Because after all, they might've been wrong in what you're telling me. Yeah. 
I mean, so why should I believe your teaching about right. what the apostle said when you're telling me the apostles could have been wrong? It's a it's a domino effect. It just keeps going. I mean, I'll never forget at the master's college when we had a uh, a Mormon apologist come in. I mean, this guy was confident. He had a camera co crew put in the back of the class. First question the class says, I'm not going to trust, uh, you know, the, the Book of Mormon because Joseph Smith was a false prophet. Look at all these false prophecies he and his apostles made of the second coming. And his <laughs> response was just brilliant. It was deflection, but it was brilliant. And he said, well, what's the problem? Jesus and your apostles in the New Testament said that the second coming was in their lifetime and generation. Uh -huh. It didn't happen. So if your apostles could be wrong, why can't mine? Crickets. I had just become a full preterist. A oh. week. A week. I thought I was the only one in the world, honestly. And I, I had dinner with that guy that night. And I said, look, the only thing you proved, because Glenn Beck is just following basically the Mormon playbook on that. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And I said, all you proved is that we should line up Jesus, his apostles, Joseph Smith, and his apostles and stone them all. Yep. That, that's all you proved. It was a great deflection. But let me show you something else. The Jesus and the New Testament apostles were not wrong. And we went, you know, being a baby full preterist, I went through the Olivet Discourse as best I could. But he was like, <laughs> I've never heard this before. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, that's the apologetic force uh, of the truth. Um, you know, when, when you have the Mormons who have refined their arguments down through the years, because they, they get their young, quote, elders, unquote. Right. And I mean, they indoctrinate them, they brainwash them, and, and they go over every argument that they hear. And they come up with some kind of argument. Now, I, uh, I there used to be a uh, Mormon, quote, tabernacle, unquote, just down the street from me when I lived in art and, uh, oh my goodness, in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And it was, it was so interesting. Most of the time, if I saw them coming, I would be standing on my porch and uh, I'd welcome them in. Well, after that happened a couple of different times, I would see them. They would literally walk across the street. They would wave at me and then just go right on. But one of the things that I did time and again, I pointed out Joseph Smith's own false prediction concerning the second coming supposed to happen in the generation of the Civil War. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. Doctrine and Covenants, I think it's 132, if, I, if memory serves me correctly. I used to really, really, really be into uh, Mormonism, studying it and refuting it. But when I presented this to these Mormon elders, and the same thing happened right here in Ardmore, Oklahoma. They were literally stunned. They had not prepared these elders for that argument. And they said, where did you get that? And I said, it's in your own book, Doctrine and Covenants. And I had it there, had it marked. I read it for them and what have you. I mean, he predicted that Britain was going to get involved in the Civil War. And that when, got, when Britain got involved in the Civil War, that was going to bring about the end of the world. Yeah. He's very all explicit. Of, and all of all of his apostles prophesied the same thing. Exactly. In their lifetime and their generation. I mean, they gave specific years. Oh, absolutely. And, and the ages they were going to be when this was going to happen. I mean, it, it's just <laughs> it, it's interesting, Don. Though Matthew sixteen twenty seven twenty eight, there's some standing here shall not die until oh. they see the Son of Man coming. Um, the Mormons take that as you know, John's still alive somewhere, roaming the earth somehow. I, I had two elders sitting in my office right here in Ardmore, two young elders. And when I, when I ran across them, I, I just asked him, I said, are you going to tell me we have people 2000 years old, still alive? <laughs> you weren't, you weren't expecting this, huh? <laughs> I was not. It was the first time I'd ever heard it. And they said, yes, absolutely. I said, excuse me. And I said, where are they? And they said, we don't know they're hidden. I said, then how do you know they're alive? And they said, well, because Jesus said they would be. Mm -hmm. I said, look, guys, this is really bad circular reasoning. I said, I'm sorry. you gotta, you got to produce the proof of what you're saying. And, of course, that conversation didn't last long. But nonetheless, th this, is, this is so critical when we point out point number one here on your chart. 
here is the prediction of Israel's last days, the, the terminal generation, the wicked and the perverse generation, a people of having blemish, a people of no understanding. And here you have the New Testament. We've already gone over how Jesus in Matthew 17, verse 17. This is a people of no understanding. Citing Deuteronomy chapter 32. And now you have Paul saying they were in the last days. Now, you left a verse off that happens to be my very favorite verse in this regard. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 11. And I've written a couple of articles on this. They're on my website, donkpreston.com. It's under Paul, the next one. Do what now? It's down on the next one. Yeah, but... I, I, I see it there. Uh, I, I should I, put I it there to you. Yeah. So anyway, to me, it's the very, I, I mean, this is a stunning text. Here is Paul, and he gives several examples of Israel's sin in the Old Testament times, uh, events that happened and people that sinned. And he said, now those things happen, and the King James, New King James, other translations rendered, these things happen unto them as examples for us. Terrible translation, terrible translation. And I'm not, I'm not saying that on my own authority, okay? I'm basing that on men like N.T. Wright, Scott McKnight, you name it, some of the most profound and wonderful Greek scholars and uh, just Bible scholars overall of the day. When they come to that passage, they say, terrible translation. And when you look at the Greek, these things happen unto them, and they are types, typoi, or typos, of, uh, of us, which means they, those events, those people were types of what was happening in the New Testament time, in the first generation. So here's Paul saying, those events, those people were types of us upon whom the ends of the ages has come. So the a second Exodus generation. Sorry, you're going. Bingo. Yes. They were in the first Exodus. This is the second Exodus. Isaiah 11. Oh, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 49, and just on and on. The power of the reality of the second Exodus. And Mike, I think I told you about it. I might even have mentioned it on this program just recently uh, on, on Facebook. I mentioned the second Exodus motif in a discussion. And this guy, and this is one of those guys that kind of basically stalked me for a good little while. <laughs> and he said, what are you talking about the second exit? I've never heard of that term. That's the most ridiculous idea. Nobody's ever thought you made that up, Preston. I go, <laughs> I'm not smart enough to make that up. <laughs> and I, 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 I just commented. I, I responded by saying, if you don't know anything about the second exodus motif, I'm not the one with a problem. Mm -hmm. You really need to do some study. So I just went to my database, started dragging out some quotes from world-renowned scholars about the second exodus, how, how that doctrine permeates the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus, ministry of Paul, how second exodus motif permeates, saturates, exudes from Ephesians, from Colossians, from so many of the New Testament books. I mean, I mean, it's just incredibly powerful. And I challenged though, boy, I said, don't come on my Facebook page and condemn me as a false teacher. Tell me I invented the doctrine of the second X. Oh, and he said, William Bell contrived and conspired to create this doctrine as well. We're the ones that invented it. So the, the Old Testament writers uh, were mistaken, apparently, when they talked about it. The rabbis who said, that the second that the Messiah would come in a second Exodus, and they're pretty much saying the millennium would be 40 years, a period right. of transitionary reign between their old covenant age and the new covenant messianic age would be 40 years. And so all these people, uh I guess he he had never heard of any of this. Well, it was obvious he hadn't. He was uh and I want to be as kind and respectful as possible, but uh, he was very unlearned. Mm. You know, he he had no, no background in the Old Testament at all. He had no background or understanding of hermeneutic. He had no understanding of audience relevance. All of these ideas were just totally foreign to him. 
everything, as we were talking about a few moments ago at the very beginning of the program, everything was about him. Everything is about his generation, uh, his narcissism, to use the term that you use. And, and as a result of that, he just simply could not see past himself now back to first corinthians chapter 10 and i didn't even see it down there so i apologize on oh, okay. seeing it on point number two here is paul says they those events and people were types of us upon whom the ends of the ages well the word ends there is from, from tell us and tell us can mean both consummation as well as goal when you've reached the goal then you've got a termination not in every case but nonetheless You've got two concepts here, termination and reaching the goal. Cool. And then he says, the ends of the ages has arrived. Well, this is from the Greek word katentao. And it is a word that is used in a scatological text. It was the goal. In other words, uh, Israel's goal, Israel's destiny, Israel's hope was to arrive at the resurrection. In Acts chapter 26, Paul said the 12 tribes earnestly serving God day and night oh. hope to attain unto the resurrection, to arrive at the resurrection. This is katentao. And so when you look at what Paul is saying, in, in perfect harmony with the passages that you have listed there, Paul is saying, look, everything the Old Testament prophets longed for that time has arrived. Yeah. And it, yet, it would be, it would be arrived because if it's the second Exodus motif, the goal would be to arrive in the land under the first one. Yes. Of course, Paul's favorite thing is in Christ, in Christ. And, and in Hebrews, it's the heavenly land. So this yes. is the goal is being in the heavenly land, the new covenant rests, inheriting the inheritance of the new creation. This was the goal. And that's what Paul's, shooting for there absolutely right and it, it's just part of his already but not yet his entire schema you know you were mentioning philippians chapter 3 when paul said that it was his desire to be found in christ and to know the power of his resurrection and he says not that i have already attained and you know you <laughs> duh, paul you know uh, yeah yeah paul oh you're telling us you hadn't died and been raised from the dead yet oh wow paul that's brilliant that's right a powerful <laughs> point yeah, powerful point. And then he immediately turns right around and says, but to the degree that we have attained. Uh, well, wait a minute. Wait being a, transformed. Being transformed. And you go, well, Paul, if you're talking about physical resurrection here, what part of you has already been attained? Has already right. attained to that? How much of your physical body has already attained unto physical resurrection? And I mean, it just simply doesn't work. But again, it's part of Paul's already but not yet schema. That, that you find everywhere in his writings. So again, the reason I love 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 is so powerful and such a powerful expression of the fact that the anticipated, there's a scholar by the name of Davidson, I've forgotten his first name at the moment, but Davidson points out and he says, the force of this is that Paul is saying what all of the previous ages had foretold, what they had anticipated, what they had longed for that time, Paul said, had arrived in the first century. Oh, that's number two. Kairos, we're getting yeah, there. That's exactly right. <laughs> the time, the appointed time had arrived. Now look, this goes back to Jesus, a passage that we looked at a couple of different times. When Jesus said, many prophets and wise men have desired, speaking to his apostles, have desired to see the things which you see to hear the things which you hear, and they have not seen them. Things that the angels desire to look into. I mean, how much clearer could it be that Jesus is saying, you know, guys, the prophets looked for it, the prophets longed to see it. And of course, this is what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 to 12, that the prophets of old foretold the salvation that was being revealed at that very time. But it was re revealed to them that not unto themselves did they minister the things of which they spoke, but unto us. There's a contrast between those old covenant times, old covenant events, old covenant prophets, and the time in which Peter and Paul, Jesus, John, and the New Testament writers were living in. And it's, boy, I tell you, in my preparation for my upcoming debate, 
with Dr. Richard Carrier, it, it, I find myself being stunned at the, um, I've been looking for the right word to be honest about it. <laughs> Arrogance is one of the words, um, but his I'll bias, get, his, his false presuppositions. That, that, that is the word that comes most prominently to mind, the, the presuppositional bias. And I was also watching a, a part of the film by James Tabor, you know, former professor at North Carolina University, brilliant scholar. And by the way, I just learned two weeks ago that he uh, and a guy posted this email to me that Tabor had sent to him because this guy was trying to get Tabor to, to debate me. And Tabor said, I'm well aware of Don Preston. I have his book on second Peter chapter three. I consider it ridiculous nonsense. So I'm not interested in, in engaging, you know, in that discussion. Well, it doesn't surprise me at all that he would consider my book ridiculous nonsense because <laughs> that book's not, that book knocks the props out, out of everything that he has to say. So he's got to, got to defend himself right but to show you that kind of bias he was he was actually commenting in a video on the book of mark and he said one of the reasons that we know mark was not written by witnesses that it's not reliable that we can't trust on it is it such a it's a book that never would have been written by an actual eyewitness or that somebody that was concerned with con, with con, uh, convincing anyone that jesus is messiah and he says for instance here you have Mark. He doesn't even mention Jesus at all until it's almost an offhanded mention of Jesus <clears throat> later in chapter one. And you, you and you have a right to say, who is this Jesus guy? And as I'm listening to him, I go, I believe that's just blatant dishonesty. <laughs> Mark chapter one, verses one and two, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ. Yeah. So Mark doesn't wait until later in a what we call a chapter to introduce this unknown guy who he will later identify as Jesus. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's just blatantly false. Here's a world-class scholar making such unfounded, blatantly false claims when the very first verse identifies what the subject of his book is about. It's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Well, Why Don, do, do this, Don. I'm I'm sorry, but Bart Ehrman has learned where the money is, and the money and all the attention is if if you go this route, yeah. the world will give you everything you want: money, fame, prestige, and they will put labels on you as oh, this guy's a world world class scholar. He's the, all this, that, and the other, and then just like you, all you have to do is read a couple verses. Oh yeah, like this is the most idiotic thing I've ever heard in my life. It, it's it's incredible the logical fallacies that in, that they engage in. You yeah. know, uh, I, I've made comment on my video for this morning that that ran this morning uh, that after our debate is over, uh, I, I I'm thinking very seriously about uh, doing some videos in response uh, to Richard Carrier's uh, videos, trying to prove that the Gospels are not reliable. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching video one video and we'll get back to our program here momentarily, but I was watching one video by him on why the gospels are unreliable and he had like five or six points. So I'm, I'm reading them and I'm going, how could any rational, logical, lo key logical person look at that list and go, Oh, wow. Yeah. That proves the gospels are unreliable. So, like I said, I'm thinking about doing a video or two. Maybe I'm not going to commit to a number. You know how I am. I'm just like you. I started, oh, yeah, I'm going to keep this short. And then it, you know, it goes here. <laughs> right. But I'm going to at least do some videos in response to Richard Carrier and why he believes the Gospels are not reliable. And I'm almost undoubtedly going to address James Tabor as well. That's good. I, I'm just astounded by the illogic. And the blatantly lost uh, false claims that some of these men, world-class scholars, are making, and it's just exactly like you're saying. They get a following, they get prominence, they get popularity, mm. they get all the applause, and they get money. Uh, and you and I have to beg for money. <laughs> I yeah, I I know, I know, <laughs> but that's okay because as we get to 
watch God's faithfulness. Uh, Amen to that. Amen and he, to that. he usually likes to come through at the last minute uh, <laughs> to test our faith. So that's okay. That's exactly All right. right. So yeah. number two, yep. we're just like Moses says, in the last days when a specific perverse generation shows up, then the appointed time of Israel's end or her slipping, her final judgment will be near at that time when that generation shows up. And so the next logical point here would be number two, where Paul does use Kairos quite a few times. Yeah. And says that the appointed time was near, just as Moses says, when the appointed time comes, it will be near. Yeah. The, the judgment would be near. Let and me he, let me toss one other verse in here. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60. Now, Isaiah chapter 60. 22, yes. Yeah. It, it is a prediction of the time in which Gentiles would be called into the kingdom. And it, it's not just the Israelites, the 10 northern tribes would be restored restored again these are genuine pagan nations that would be brought and, and the incredible the incredible thing and i made mention of this on many different occasions throughout the old testament there are some statements that are made that if you're truly conversant with the um with the jewish religion with the tanakh with temple and the cultists Comments are made that are so astounding, they're so revolutionary that you have to think that ancient rabbis would go, whoa, 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 well, what will that mean? Oh, whoa, wait, well, uh, do we do we really want this? This is bad news for the temple. Because in Isaiah chapter 60, uh, when it when it talks about the wealth of the Gentiles, uh, will come to Zion and will come to you. Uh, and he talks about caravans bringing their wealth and what have you. But notice what he says. Um, the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance. Wait a minute. They, these are Nebaioth and, and Kedar. These are not Israelites. They shall come to you. Now notice what he says. They, that's the citizens of these foreign countries shall ascend with acceptance on my altar and I will glorify the house of my glory. What verse are you in? I'm, I'm in verse seven. Okay. Isaiah 16, verse seven. So here you have the promise that these Gentiles who are going to bring their wealth to Zion to, to join with Israel, these pagans are going to ascend the altar. Well, look, if they are of Kedar and Nebaioth, they're not Levites. They're not of the temple. And yet they're going to ascend the altar and make acceptable sacrifices. And God says, in their doing that, my temple will be glorified. Well, yeah. not the old covenant temple. <laughs> just, just like the eunuchs, Isaiah says, you know, are going to come in. And, you know, since we're on this thread, let's go to Isaiah 49, 8, where Kairos is used. <laughs> and Paul quotes it and kind okay. of... Maybe I, I'm I, want to get, I want to get down there in verse 22, and then we'll go yes. right back to yes. 49. But in Isaiah chapter 60 and, and verse 22, uh, and, and again, this is a passage that predicted the new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, I'll read verse 21 and 22. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand. Now, this is, this is a direct echo of Deuteronomy 32, how shall one put a thousand to flight? Okay. And a small one, a strong nation, I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. In the appointed time, God would hasten fulfillment. Make it be fulfilled quickly. Exactly right. Exactly right. Now then, Isaiah 49. Yes. Wow. <laughs> this is this is awesome. Isaiah 49, 8. Let me go ahead and read that. Um, thus says the Lord, in a time, all right, Kairos, in the appointed time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land. Now, I can already hear some premillennialists in the last passage you quoted, the land forever, 
And what's all this references to the land? You know, yeah. that's, therefore we have to be premillennials. But folks, all you have to do is read Hebrews and everything mm -hmm. else. The apostolic hermeneutic is that Israel's land promises were a type and a shadow of being in a person in Christ, right. his in righteousness. Christ Jesus. Amen. So there's just so much here in Isaiah 49. And of course, Paul quotes this in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. But let's unpack a little bit of, of Isaiah 49 because there's just so much here. I like uh, verse 23. Uh, Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down. And then uh, he talks about them being a light for the, the Gentiles. Where's oh, that? Yes. Well, I had that. Uh, let me see. That should be back up in, um, yeah, verse six. Uh, uh, verse. Yeah, verse six. Oh, okay. I was, I was on the wrong page. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Wow. Well, let's, like I said, like you said, let's unpack this because, you know, we have this doctrine out there that, that uh, salvation was strictly for Israel. Israel only is what it's called. Right. Isaiah 49, six is an absolute total refutation of that. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 49 begins with a prophecy of the restoration of the 10 tribes. It begins like that. And there's also another reality that I have pointed out on numerous occasions. And it, it's absolutely remarkable. Throughout the book of Isaiah, you have prophecy, the prophecies of the restoration of the 10 tribes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> then you have prophecies of the restoration of Zion. Well, what's Zion? That's Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. Jerusalem wasn't destroyed when the 10 northern tribes were carried off into captivity right. that wouldn't be for 230 years or so right so why is isaiah pardon me who is focused on the restoration of the 10 tribes expanding his restorationist doctrine to include judah and jerusalem zion hmm. this is purely messianic but then it goes beyond that and that's what Isaiah 49, 6 does. Speaking of Messiah, and the rabbis acknowledge this as messianic. It is too small of a thing for you that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Now, a scholar by the name of Stapleton uh, wrote a book uh, about Israel and the identity of Israel. Uh, in a very revealing fact, they, they tried to quote Staples, Stapleton, um, as supporting in a scholarly support of Israel only. Well, I, I had this really, even though I did not at the time have his book, it's either Staples or Stapleton. I've got it in a stack right over there. And I've read most of it, not all of it, but I've read all of the pages that are pertinent. Anyway, <clears throat> they tried to quote him supporting IO. Mm -hmm. I had a I had a feeling that they were being dishonest. And I've got a long history of IOLers who are dishonest. So I didn't trust the quotation. So I got the book. Sure enough, absolutely totally misquoting him, misrepresenting him, blatantly misrepresenting him. He in no way supports Israel only. As a matter of fact, on Isaiah 49, verse 6, mm -hmm. he makes a comment something like this to paraphrase. When Isaiah said, or when Yahweh said through Isaiah, it is too small of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Staple says the tribes of Jacob is a reference to all 12 tribes, not just two or not just 10. It mm -hmm. is a reference to all 12 tribes. And then he goes on, or to restore, restore the preserved ones of Israel. Now, <clears throat> this is very obviously a Hebrew parallelism. The tribes of Jacob are the tribes of Israel. But Staples goes ahead to say, I will give you as a light to the Gentiles. He says, now in a surprising move, Yahweh decides to include the pagans and bring them into Israel's salvation. Well, when I, uh, when I posted that, 
the actual quote from this scholar refuting them. They said, oh, well, uh, nobody really believes in him anymore. He's been discredited. Uh, no, they've been. No, you've been discredited. You've been discredited <laughs> and, and exposed as dishonest for trying to use him when, in fact, he utterly rejects your doctrine. Right. But unfortunately, I've had them do that over and over and over again. But not only him, but virtually all scholarship agrees that you have a you have a Hebrew parallelism here in verse six about the tribes of Jacob and then the reserved preserved ones of Israel. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> because he says restoring Israel is not enough for the work of Messiah. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles. Well, if the Gentiles are Israel, then that's too small of a thing for, for Messiah to do right. because the passage is emphatic. It's too small of a thing to restore Israel. I'll also do this through you. But again, <clears throat> hope I'm not being too repetitious. If the Gentiles are Israel, then you have God saying, in addition to doing the too small of a thing, I'm going to do the too small of a thing. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a tautology. That's and it's good. just ridiculous. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk it. about, so Christ is the light to the Gentiles, but so is the church, but specifically concerning the church, I think there was an apostle who really picked up on this and mm -hmm. saw and, and went to every known nation at that time to Many preach the gospel. And he'd go to the synagogue, he'd preach to the Jew first. Yep. And at those synagogues, you had Gentiles, you had God fears, you had proselytes. And then from there, he would go into the streets and, exactly and preach right. the gospel to the Gentiles, fulfilling this very passage. And many, many scholars have taken note of the fact that Paul is relating himself as God's servant here. But he's not the, he's not the new covenant. And so there seems to be almost a double entendre here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jesus is the Messiah to, to bring the salvation. Paul is the servant of the Messiah to preach that salvation and they're yeah. both the lights of the gentiles um, yeah. but anyway numerous numerous scholars have done that by the way I, i've got to make comment on this you you pointed out second corinthians chapter six and i saw this years ago and i've used this uh, I'll, I'll i'll never forget this when i was still minister <clears throat> at the east main church of christ in shawnee oklahoma i was there for 11 years marvelous time one sunday night I had, you know, the, the service had concluded. I walked out of the auditorium through a side door on the north end, and I looked down the hall, and there was, to be honest about it, a pretty scruffy-looking guy talking to one of the members, and I thought to myself, well, here comes a benevolent case, and the person saw me, our member saw me, and pointed to me, and I thought, okay, here we go. Uh, I guess I'll be busy for the next little bit. Well, the guy came to me. Well, as it turned out, he was a uh, a nephew of one of our members, one of our very faithful members. And he said, I want to tell you something. I'm a dispensationalist. I am a premillennialist through and through and through. But he said, if you can prove to me that premillennialism is false, I'll be baptized. And I said, do you have your clothes with you? <laughs> he said, well, no, no, no. Let's Let's sit down. Let's really study this. I said, okay, when do you want to do this? And I got to tell you, Mike, over, over a period of almost six weeks, we studied, and he wanted to study the temple and the land and the restoration of Israel, obviously. 1948 was a big deal to him, okay? Right. Okay, we came down, and I used Isaiah 49 with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, along with Ezekiel chapter 37. Right. You know, here is God promising to restore Israel to the land, the all 12 tribes, and to put his tabernacle among them. Mm -hmm. And I will be your God, you will be my people. Here, Paul says, in the accepted time, in the day of salvation, it's the time of the restoration of the land and the new covenant. I went over those with him, and I let Paul, I just asked him to read Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 18 and following into chapter 6, verse 4. 
I said, now, where did Paul apply Ezekiel? And where did Paul apply Isaiah 49? And he went to the church. I said, okay. I said, and he said, I want to be baptized right now. So we did <laughs> about midnight that night. <clears throat> but that's the power of this text. Now watch this. And when I very first saw this, it just, it just had Paul and what you were just going over written all over it. That is that some scholars see Paul as being a light to the Gentiles. Okay. Now watch. What we find in, in Isaiah 49 is what? <clears throat> the ministry of reconciliation, right? Reconciliation between the 10 tribes and the two tribes, right? And then <clears throat> in addition to reconciling Israel to Judah, it's reconciling them to the Gentiles. And then you have Jew, Israel, Gentile, all being reconciled to God. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. And as, as Mike just went over, what did Paul do? He went, first of all, to the Jews in the synagogues, although he went into regions where there are synagogues of the diaspora. But he preached to the Jew, preached to Israel, and he preached to the Gentiles. And he said, God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We beseech you, be ye reconciled to God. So here's Paul, the very expression <clears throat> of the minister of the ministry of reconciliation, applying Isaiah 49 and Ezekiel 37 to his, his day, his ministry and the church. I mean, this is incredible stuff. You know, talking about Paul being a minister with this specific commission, maybe a little bit of Isaiah 66 and a little bit of Romans, where Paul believed that he was offering up the Gentiles Great as a priest, as a sweet sacrifice to God, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember. Absolutely. That. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he touches on that very powerfully in Romans chapter 15. Mm hmm. Uh, in, in which his ministry, and of course, uh, scholars kind of debate what he's talking about there because he has the gathering of offerings from the Gentiles. So here, here is food and money and what have you that he's gathered up from the Gentiles to take to Jerusalem to dispense during a time of famine. <clears throat> but the language that he uses is, is liturgical language when he says that he is presenting the offering of the Gentiles to God. So the scholars almost seem to be divided on this in, uh, in saying, well, was Paul saying that he was offering up the gifts from the Gentiles to God? Or was he saying that in offering these gifts from the Gentiles, he is actually offering up the Gentiles as an offering to God? Well, I prefer the latter because it segues so beautifully into Isaiah 66 that you were just pointing out. Yeah. And at the end of uh, Isaiah 49 here, verse 26, I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Revelation Babylon. Uh, yeah. Then all flesh, all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. So, you know, Israel was that fishbowl for all the nations of the world and whatever happened to her, you know, they saw and they would either fear, praise God or, you know, have multiple reactions. But in AD 70, that's when the floodgates of the Gentiles came in. But be between that period, AD 30 to 80, 70, we have this already not yet yeah. where Paul is going to every nation and he, why did he want to go to Spain so bad? Why did he want to go to Tarshish so bad? Of course, Jonah flees to the <laughs> farthest part of the, the then known world to go there in rebellion against God commissioning him to Nineveh, the Gentiles. Paul, in obedience to the mission, gets stuck in Rome, 
is in prison, but is released and then gets there and he, and he accomplishes the mission. And so getting back to 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the eschatological telos, the end, we go right back to Matthew 24, uh, 14, the gospel and Mark uh, 13, 11, the gospel must be preached to all nations, to all the world. And then the end, the end of what? The end of Deuteronomy 32, verse five. In that generation, the end is going to come. And yep. at the appointed time, it would be near. What? The end. So that had to take place. And it had to be Gentiles. It wasn't just to the, you know, to the 10 lost tr northern tribes. Who were never lost. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. We see him in the Gospels, uh, Anna and... Uh, uh, I, absolutely. I mean, there's no question about it. I made that comment to one person who was saying to me that they believe that we're in the little uh, the little season of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8, you know, Satan, Satan being released and said, and so the 10 northern tribes who were lost, you know, they're going to be uh, they're going to be restored. And I said, well, they were never lost. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you got Anna uh, and Simeon. It, was it Simeon? Is that right? Yeah, the elderly man. That... Yeah, the elderly man. <clears throat> and I said, here they are. Simeon takes up the child and says, Lord, I thank you that you've allowed me to see the salvation of Israel. Uh, well, to whom was the salvation to come? To all 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. So he, he is certainly representative, uh, if nothing more than symbolically, but on a, of one tribe, he of another tribe of the 10, nor 10 northern tribes. They weren't last, lost at all. Even Josephus is very emphatic. That the, that the diaspora was the 10 northern tribes. And he says, they are beyond the Euphrates in numbers that cannot be counted. They had no illusion that they were lost, that they had been completely, you know, disappeared or what have you. Matter of fact, in John 7, chapter 7, verse 35, when Jesus said, I'm going to go away and where I go, you cannot come. And the Jews are kind of looking around at one another, you know, where's it going to go? Where's it going to go? And someone pops up and says, well, is he going to go to our brethren who are among the Gentiles? He's talking yeah. about the diaspora. Yeah. And so they, they had a very clear concept that their brethren, the 10 northern tribes, were out there. And they generally identified that as the region beyond Euphrates in the Babylonian uh, Babylonian region, of course, Babylon, Babylon itself, the kingdom had been destroyed long, long before, but they still identified the region as where their brethren, the diaspora had been scattered. So all, all, all of this now back to this point that I started on a moment ago. And, and that is you have in Isaiah 49, this concept of <coughs> <coughs> the restoration of all 12 tribes. The reconciliation of the Gentiles. And what you find in Isaiah over and over and over again is in these passages in which the restoration of the 10 tribes is present, you also have the restoration of Zion. Well, Mike, as you well know, the restoration of Zion is almost a byword, not a byword, that's a negative connotation, but it's almost a synonym for all 12 tribes being restored. Mm -hmm. The restoration of Zion is not just the two tribes and it's not just the 10, it's all 12 tribes. So what you have in the promise of the restoration of Zion is an implicit prediction of all 12 tribes being restored in Messiah. This is powerfully brought out in Isaiah 61 and 62. I will not keep my peace until Zion is restored, to mm -hmm. paraphrase. So here is Isaiah anticipating the restoration of Zion, i.e. all 12 tribes. And by the way, <clears throat> it, it, it is projected forward to speak of the time in which is, uh, Jerusalem had been forsaken, had been destroyed, and the promise is given, you will no longer be called a forsaken city you'll be called the city of the living God. Well, that's Hebrews chapter 12, by the way, where the writer says you have come to Mount Zion 
to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. But now watch what he does. In addition to the restoration of Zion, Gentiles shall come to see your glory. Mm -hmm. Gentiles will bring their wealth to you. That's back to chapter 60 as well. So restoration of Zion is the restoration of all 12 tribes under the heading of under the heading of the restoration of Zion, restoration of Jerusalem. So you can't then say, well, in addition to Zion, it's going to be 12 tribes. No, Zion would be restored when the 10 were, were restored. Yeah. They're all synchronous. <clears throat> but when he then adds to that, just like Isaiah 49 does, I will also make you a light to the Gentiles. That is including, including the pagans who would come to be joined and join with the people of God, the righteous remnant of Israel, to create one new man, the new creation in Christ. Yes. As Solomon being a type of Christ, uh, with his great wealth, you found that the nations, Gentile nations, would come with literal wealth, gold, silver, everything to build that temple. Yes. And so Messiah is now bringing in the wealth of the nations, but the wealth is not material, it's faith. The wealth that the Gentiles are bringing in, it's their faith. And their faith is building up one new man, one new temple. In amen. Ephesians. And uh, that, Beautiful that's, picture, beautiful picture. Amen, a good one to end on, I guess, because I think- Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, so folks, we're gonna pick this back up at number two, because we have some more, mm -hmm. Kairos appointed times by Paul that oh, are boy, really, really are. awesome. So we'll yeah. unpack that next Friday. That's right. Don't miss it. All right, brother. Take care. All right. Good night. All right. Love that I may walk before my God in the